Good afternoon. Uh, I do have a uh, I do have one building that I wanted to talk about in our, our project in Guangzhou, China, and it's a bit of a case study. It starts out talking about what our initial goals and ambitions were, and then leads to uh, what happens when you get into the reality of some of the constraints of, uh, of the world. And uh, this project uh, started for us as a design competition about two years ago. And uh, we had set a goal for ourselves that this building uh, would be a, a zero energy building, a net zero energy building, and have zero carbon emissions. Uh, but before we could even start that process, we had to uh, define uh, what zero energy meant uh, at that point in time. Uh, there was no one singular definition, and I think today, if you looked on the internet, you would find at least uh, four of them that exist. But. Uh, The reality of it is uh, we had been designing zero energy buildings for, for thousands of years, and it's really only been within the last uh, 100 years or so that we've gotten away from designing zero energy buildings. So it is, it is somewhat interesting that we, we now look to technology to try to help us get back to where we started from when it was, in fact, technology that, that uh, brought us away from this in the first place. So this is a project, uh, a, a picture I took while driving through rural Virginia. And I, I even found another example of what I'd call a net positive energy building, a building that produces more energy than it consumes. Uh, but we did hear, hear earlier today the, the impact uh, that buildings have uh, on the environment and on carbon emissions. And it is a fact that buildings contribute more carbon to the atmosphere than either uh, transportation or industry. A lot of money, research and development has been put into transportation and into industry over the years to figure out ways to reduce the amount of carbon uh, that is emitting, but relatively speaking, uh, hardly any money has been put into figuring out solutions for buildings. So we heard Gary talk a little bit about uh, <coughs> ecological footprint and uh, how many global hectares uh, uh, the city uh, uh, requires per person. And the world does have the, the capability of supporting um, each person with 1.8 global hectares. And in the mid-1980s, we hit a tipping point where the uh, world had gone beyond its capacity to sustain with all the people that we have, given how much we consume. And the United States has always, uh, or in recent years, has had the distinction of, of having the worst ecological footprint and until recently when the UAE has surpassed the USA in uh, ecological footprint per person. Now, I'm talking about a building in China today, so I wanted to show you where China is on this map. Uh, today, uh, although the cities, individuals living in cities have uh, a relatively high ecological footprint, overall, the average person in China uh, has uh, an ecological footprint less than most countries in the world but that is changing very, very rapidly. China is the, uh, the, the world's biggest uh, construction uh, market right now, and uh, the rate of growth there is, is staggering. And if you look at what's happening in the population uh, in China uh, over uh, the last uh, 50 years or so, uh, this green line shows the population in rural areas. The red line shows the population in urban areas. So in addition to the overall population growing, we have a condition where people are leaving the rural areas and moving into the urban areas. Well, the significance of this is for each person that moves from the countryside into the city, that person consumes 250% more energy than they did before they moved. So when you talk about how many people are moving, the number is roughly 600 million people. It's kind of a difficult number to, to wrap your, your mind around, but if you think about it being uh, the entire population of, of the United States and Mexico, Canada, and, uh, and Western Europe combined, that's roughly the, the number of people we're talking about. So the impact that this will have on energy consumption and on carbon emissions is, is almost difficult to imagine. In addition to that, in China, we see a decline in the amount of wheat, rice, and corn that they're able to uh, provide for themselves. 
And when you look at all of the pollutants coming into the air, specifically carbon monoxide, uh, I, I think you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, China has largely become uh, the factory to the world, and, um, and the emissions uh, being generated from that one country into the atmosphere are, are significant. Respiratory disease in the country has increased by 50% in the last decade. Now the plans are for China to build one, new, uh, one brand new coal burning power plant every nine days uh, for the next 10 years. So it, it is not a, a situation that is uh, going to get better uh, almost regardless of, of how we design our buildings. Now, uh, Chicago this year has had more snow than it's had in, in many, many years, and, uh, and Dubai has been a little bit cooler this year than it has been in recent. So we hear a lot of people saying, what, what happened to that global warming thing? I guess it went away. It is difficult to, to see uh, the impact of global warming on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it, some days it seems like it might be getting better. But one, uh, one indicator is uh, sea level and looking at what happens uh, with the, the rise of sea level. And sea level has been rising steadily for many years now. But what I think is somewhat disturbing is the rate of change that we see with the sea level rising. Uh, this first graph here shows about a 15 year period where sea level uh, rose 50 millimeters. And then in the 15 years after that, it rose 135 millimeters. Uh, that is a 270% change or uh, increase in the rate of change. And we're seeing similar increases in the rate of change. And this is what's leading many experts to enter into a debate on, on how high will the sea go? Will it be one meter? Will it be six meters? Will it be somewhere in between? Uh, but there seems to be consensus that uh, it, will, it will rise, and it will rise uh, probably at least a meter well, in China, if, uh, if the sea level did rise one meter, that would put an area the size of Portugal underwater. And it's an area that right now is, is uh, home to more than half of uh, China's population and 60% of its economic output. So for all of those reasons, uh, we think it's important that the buildings that we build in China and around the world um, use less energy, produce less carbon, and begin to uh, bring those curves back down a bit. So this Pearl River project in China, uh, we set a goal, it would be a transformed, integrated, high performance and environmentally responsible design. Uh, we wanted it to be a zero energy building. That was the original concept. Uh, we won the competition and two years ago entered into design. And, um, and I'll take you through some of the systems. Uh, to be able to take this on, we, we actually formed a new group within our firm uh, called our Performative Design Team. And the premise of this group was, uh, it's a group made up of architects and engineers, uh, researchers, and uh, computer simulators. And the idea here is that form for the sake of form is no longer good enough. We need to look at form as it relates to the overall performance of a building. We came up with a, a four-step approach to high-performance design reduction strategies, uh, reclamation strategies, passive absorption strategies, and generation strategies. And just a, a brief description of what each one of these are. Uh, reduction strategies are all the different things you might do within a building design to reduce the consumption, the appetite for consumption. And, uh, and there are dozens and dozens of things that, that our industry is currently doing. Uh, so if you think of the building as a black box, you want to reduce the amount of consumption of that black box. Uh, reclamation, uh, once the energy is inside that box, you want to do everything you can to keep from letting that energy back out. You want to recapture that energy and reuse it over and over again. Those are reclamation strategies. Passive absorption, this is uh, largely the focus of our performative design group, looks at energy streams that surround a building, that pass over, around, and through underneath the building, and finding different ways to tap into those energy streams to reduce uh, the, re the uh, consumption of fossil fuels. And then lastly, generation. Uh, we heard this morning the story about electric cars and how uh, electric cars may not be uh, all that sustainable, mainly because the electric grid is 20% efficient. 
Well, we now know how to build power plants in our buildings, ones that are much more efficient, 70, 80, even 85% efficient. So if we could do this, we should do this. And not only do we have efficient power for ourselves, we can share that power with our neighbors and turn a city into a power plant or a network of power plants, hence significantly reducing the, the overall amount of, of uh, fossil fuel that a building, that a, a city needs to consume. So I won't get into all of them, but some examples of reduction strategies that were used uh, in our Pearl River Tower. High efficient uh, lighting, high performance glazing, double walls, uh, um, high efficient uh, uh, HVAC plant. Reclamation strategies, we recovered heat from exhaust streams, generator heat recovery, uh, we, uh, we uh, captured condensate off of cooling coils. And passive absorption strategies, our building has uh, wind turbines and photovoltaics, and we looked at geocondenser cooling system for the building. And then for generation, we looked at micro turbines that could generate power at 85% efficiency once we reclaim the, the heat from the, from the uh, generation process. So uh, here's an image of the, the body of the building. Uh, what we've learned through our modeling of the building is that every corner, every shape uh, of the building changes uh, its dynamics. Uh, we wanted to be able to make use, for example, of the wind and how the wind interacted with the building. And uh, not just the wind, but the pressure differentials that the wind create on the surface of the building and on the, on, the, on the windward and the leeward side of the buildings. And subtle changes in the shape and corners and angles had significant uh, impact on those pressure differentials. So this Pearl River Tower is a 309 meter tall, 71 story tower under construction right now in Guangzhou. It sits along a park in an area, a new town area of Guangzhou. Its positioning along the park is very important. Uh, the winds are, are coming from the south for about 10 months of the year, and uh, the park is to our south, so uh, it provided a great opportunity for us to take advantage of that wind and know that we would have access to that wind for many years to come. Uh, there is no silver bullet, uh, no um, magic pill to get to zero energy. There were 32 different strategies in our original concept uh, that, that got us to zero energy, and we needed every one of them to get, get there. Uh, the wind is, is one of the more unique aspects of the building, so I'll, I'll focus on that a little bit. Uh, again, the idea here is that uh, when wind hits the face of the building, a positive pressure pocket is created. As you have vortex shedding around the sides of the building, you have a negative pressure pocket that builds up uh, on the back side of the building. Uh, we uh, poked holes in the building. There are four large openings that essentially function as pressure relief vents. It allows those two pressures uh, to equalize. Uh, air is, uh, wind is literally uh, drawn through the building and accelerates as it comes through the building. Uh, two curves right here, uh, one showing um, the natural increase in velocity with wind as you move uh, from the ground. Uh, the second curve to the right uh, shows the power potential associated with that increase in velocity. One great thing about wind is uh, when you're looking at generating power from it, there is a cube relationship between the power potential and the wind velocity meaning a very small increase in velocity can translate into a rather large increase in power potential. So tall buildings are, are naturals for looking at wind technology. We studied this thing in a wind tunnel, and uh, the, the left-hand circle here represents uh, some readings that we took in the wind tunnel on one of the upper holes within the building. What we did is we put the, we put the model in the, build, uh, in the wind tunnel, and we took a measurement of air approaching the building and air passing through the opening, and then we rotated the building 10 degrees, took those measurements, and continued on until the building was rotated all the way around. So as you can imagine, uh, the, the wind approaching the building doesn't change as you rotate the building, um, but the wind uh, through the openings does. And on this upper tunnel, we showed a, a, a doubling of wind speed passing through. And, um, and what was a bit of a surprise to us is unless the wind was hitting the building at a 90 degree angle, 
we saw this effect happening, meaning it didn't have the wind didn't have to be uh, hitting the the building head on. It could be at a at a rather wide angle, and we saw the ability to produce power regardless of whether the wind was coming from the south, which it does ten minutes of the year, or from the north. The real big surprise, when we get down to the lower openings in the building, as you would expect, the winds are, are much lighter, uh, so the winds approaching the buildings were, which mu were much less. But the wind passing through the opening was just as, as fast as the winds passing through the, uh, through the upper openings. And again, uh, we believe that this is a result of, of um, the air moving through the openings has uh, less to do with the velocity of the wind approaching the building as it does the, uh, the, the magnitude of the pressure that is built up on the face of the building. So in addition to using our wind tunnel testing, we also uh, modeled this in CFD uh, and we got very similar results. But this, um, what this CFD model shows is that uh, when we have a, a wind speed of about four meters per second approaching the building, we would then see those uh, wind speeds increase to as much as eight meters per second uh, passing through the hole. And uh, again, a doubling of velocity because of this cubed relationship, two times two times two, there's an 800% increase in power potential for the single turbine, meaning one turbine within this opening can generate as much power as eight turbines that would be located outside of this opening. So we took advantage of that by putting vertical axis wind turbines within the openings. Uh, the vertical axis wind turbines are uh, a, a good choice for us because uh, we didn't have to worry about issues with bird kill. Uh, they're relatively uh, low noise, uh, low vibration compared to uh, propeller type turbines. But in addition to the wind, uh, there were a number of other features. Uh, we were able to, uh, we have an internally ventilated facade uh, that uh, absorbs heat. We use the heat for dehumidification in the building, so we don't need to use chilled water. Uh, we looked at solar radiation. Uh, there's photovoltaics on the building, not symmetric on the building, but yet they're exactly where they should be based on our, on our uh, solar radiation models. Uh, we have strategies to drive light uh, very deep in the building to, to uh, be able to turn off lights and, and uh, take advantage of daylight harvesting. And uh, perhaps one of the, the more significant things we do, this building is not cooled with air, it's cooled with water. Uh, water is a much more efficient means of, of conditioning a space. So it's the ceiling system in the building that is the cooling mechanism. Air is brought in only for ventilation purposes. It is brought in once. Uh, it is not recirculated in the building. So the quality of the air is much better. And the heat that was recaptured is used for dehumidification. So this, uh, this system allowed us a very small uh, underfloor air um, delivery areas and the ceiling sandwich was very thin. And as a result of that, we were able to take heat that otherwise uh, would be drawn uh, far into the space and reverse that flow. The exterior wall is our return air plenum. And again, that heat is brought back up and we use the, the sun's energy to dehumidify the air, which is very important in Guangzhou, a very humid climate. And by adjusting the amount of air from the, the floor, uh, the temperature of the water through the ceiling uh, system, and the amount of air that we bring through the cavity, we were able to achieve a, really an optimal uh, condition with, re with uh, respect to mean radiant temperature and operative temperature. Uh, so that you could use space right up against the perimeter wall. Uh, we also had a geothermal condenser system planned that was not part of the final project. Uh, we found the groundwater was too warm. And our micro turbines that were a big part of our overall strategy were also eliminated. And uh, only for the reason that in the city of Guangzhou right now they do not allow net metering. That is a policy that uh, they are looking at changing. And if and when they do, uh, the building has the space to allow uh, the owner to go back and install these microturbines after the fact. So our original concept, which included these reduction, reclamation, absorption, and generation strategies, did get us to zero energy. Once we lost the microturbines and a few of the other strategies, that changed. But uh, we still were looking at 
a scenario where compared to an ASHRAE 90.1 model, we were able to reduce energy by 58%. And because of this narrow ceiling sandwich, we were able to reduce 300 millimeters per floor over the height of the building and over a 71-story building that turned into five floors. So within the same envelope, we were able to give the owner five additional floors or 100,000 square feet of additional rentable area. In addition to that, because of the reduction in air handling units and duct size, shaft size, the core is 8% smaller than other buildings that we benchmarked. So when you take in not only the savings and energy costs, but the additional revenue for rents, uh, all of these technologies uh, were able to pay themselves back in 4.8 years. So today the project is under construction. And maybe my laptop's out of battery. So, <laughs> so with that, uh, I will turn it over to the next speaker.